This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Calvin Leach. Calvin, how are we? I'm all right, James. I'm with my old Macca. Yeah, it's yeah, been a long time, time, isn't it? Well, do you know what? Uh, the best podcast ever done of uh, to this day is, is the one with you. And we got on so well. And obviously, we stayed in touch, seeing, seeing each other. We've done the charity football match together. We've done the, you've compared on my shows before. The Live stuff. audiences in Liverpool, yeah, Glasgow. Yeah. So, you know, um, we've always had a great time. We've always got, got on the sense of humour and everything. You know, being a Rangers fan, I've always looked pretty shady. <laughs> <laughs> I came close to blocking yeah. you a few times through that, brother. And we've got mutual friends, as you know, yeah. uh, especially old Frankie boy, McAvenny. Yeah, yeah he's a good man. guy, Frank. Great, man. great, love of Frank. So he has. But, uh, I saw where I've been out of the way and sort of step back. I still do my, my shows and I travel and the audiences, but I'm 65 now and I've been doing it since 2007, James. But I really wanted to come out because, like, before we, we spoke about the rave scene, all the things, we've done the Essex Boys, and it's just really, I wanted to catch up with you, but in public, and tell people, because people just, all oh, they want to go, Essex Boys, this, this, all I want people to know is the Essex boys was that much of my life. You know, the rest of my life is, is, is more to me than just the Essex boys. And I wasn't an Essex boy, never was. I'm with me son, Tony Tucker was my mate when we discussed this before. I never said, went round and said that uh, I was an Essex boy. I find it totally embarrassing to call myself an Essex boy. Um, and I'm just sick to death of people fucking sending me messages. You need to come on here. You need to say this. You need to... I don't need to talk to anyone. I've got nothing to prove to anyone. The only people I've got people, things to prove for are my friends, my family, and the people who love me. Like, if, and if I've got justice before myself, they're the people. Even you, you're my friend. If you ask me a personal question, like, off air, I wouldn't lie to you. I could look you in and, 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 and I trust you. And hence why I'm sitting here now. And I felt, do you know what? I really need, there's a lot going on, as you well know, even with yourself with what's going on in this world. And, and I think it's time we had a little open art chat to chat uh, about, about stuff. Yeah, I think everybody knows your life story. You've yeah. books and movies and podcasts. The podcast we done was in a shop in your friend's fucking clothes yeah. shop. In, in, uh, in Rumford. Yeah, I was only starting at that journey. And it's, uh, but like you say, there's more layers to your story. Yeah. You've lived that life. You were proper back in the day. The ICF, yeah. the fucking bouncer. The uh, underworld. The shit that you've done in the yeah, underworld, yeah. the shit that you've been involved in. Obviously, the Essex boys were, what, nearly 30 years later? Yeah. They still spoke about. And it's always going to be spoke about. That's just something you have to fucking yeah. live with. Of yeah. There's more to, like I say, your story, which we'll touch on. Again, the book, Calton, the final say. Yeah. Where can people buy your book, Calton? 
Uh, I'll self-publish it off of Amazon, and it was uh, I think number. It's been that's over three years. It's been out, and it's still. But it was the best seller. It was number one, I think, for two years on on the on the thing. So I'm quite proud of that. And I was sitting in Spain and the, the first long COVID, and obviously they had the thing out there. You know, with the COVID, you could uh, you, uh, you could go out. You had curfews. You had to be up seven o'clock in the morning. You had to seven o'clock at night. Uh, Basically, you had to be in by seven, and seven o'clock in the morning you was allowed out, and it was more stricter out there because you know the old guard. Yeah, they do love a find, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> Get each other and go like make it up as they go along. But uh, and I was just sitting there, a lot of time on me plate. A uh, lot of people weren't travelling, obviously on holidays and that, and because I had a place out there and everything. And uh, my right hand man Jay, he just said to me, "Why don't you just do another book?" And it's been years since I uh, like, but something honest and gritty and. In that time, I lost my father to dementia, and he was my real hero, a little East End man, you know, in the Royal Navy from the age of 14, brought me up, and I didn't really re realise the, what a proper man he was until sort of like late on in life, and what, to watch a man, a man's man, like, die in front of you and become a, a man and a baby and watch him in a cot with a nappy on, like being fed by a beaker, like like and holding a nurse's hand and being, it was heartbreaking, you know what I mean? And, uh, and he, the last, he stopped talking to everyone except me and, and I was visiting him in hospital and he had my dressing gown on, he never had a dressing gown and he was on his thing, I said, go get him. Go on the landing and get the, the girl I was seeing at that time. Well, not with now, uh, thank God. But anyway, so she'd go get him a cup of tea and it'd be just me and him sitting there. Go, you all right, Dad, and all that. And he just, this day, I've never seen my dad cry, and he just started crying. He went, I don't want to be like this, son. I went, he always said, call me his all right, boy, son, like old he said. And I went, don't get upset, Dad. Like, because like, it, it, it done me, because I felt like, how do I deal with this this moment in my life? I never thought he'd ever come to that. He went, oh, and he's been around the world twice. He joined the Merchant Navy at 14. His mum died when he was 12. Uh, his dad, well, I never knew, he fucked off with another bird, left him and his sisters and brothers in Dagenham to bring themselves up. And they were all teenagers. They all had to leave school and work. And... Uh, so to survive, he, he lied about his age and he, he was in the Merchant Navy from the age of 14. And he ended up travelling the world twice and being on the Queen Elizabeth and looking after the likes of Richard Burton, Liz Taylor, Robert Mitchum, and they all knew him by his first name. He was their personal person and, and all that. So he's seen everything. He'd been around the world twice. You know, lived in Germany for months where they docked or Australia. So I knew it a lot and... Um, he went, I don't want to die. Like, and he, I said, what's the matter? And he said, I don't want to be this person. And he said, like, after all I've done in my life and what I've been, and it, like, he was involved with with the Quays in the 60s, sending, like, long firm, like, Uki Kia, because I remember as a kid growing up in the East End. And not one part of the criminal element, but he sold, the, like, stuff from parcels as we used to say and i remember people coming around getting the money and like always kept it and he always had um in them days in the 60s like calves well, they were the meeting point like where the dorm had finished work they'd have them still open with the music going and it was a meeting place and he told me stories from that later on in life and uh, he was a very and he and he just said like i don't want to end up like I am he said like I, I said I've had enough and it, that day he stopped talking and he, he would talk, talk to me like but not put a conversation he wouldn't hold a conversation with no one my sister anyone visited him he just stopped my granddaughters and, they, and he idolised them and he just he just went like switched off and from then he, I watched him deteriorate deteriorate but he still like always remember and I, thought, and I, and I knew that he didn't want to be here because he had said that. When he when he stopped talking, I knew that was him switching off. And he was telling me, I've had enough, boy. And it was one of the saddest things in my life because it doesn't matter how hard you are, how powerful you are, how much money you've got, what you what you can get get your hands on. Like, you can't 
I could not cure him or, or, or I didn't have the power or the strength or the finance, whatever, to, to, to bring my old dad back. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. My dad was the same, big, strong man, yeah. a bouncer. Everybody loved him, got diagnosed with leukemia and you just see them deteriorate and it's painful. You would rather it was just instant. You know I mean? It was still painful losing them, but to yeah. see them suffer the way they yeah. suffer yeah. and there's fuck all you can do is the worst feeling in the world and the majority of people now have you, lost. I'd, I'd rather fight 20 men yeah. and get beat the fuck than, than, than have to go like visit him and it become harder and harder to go and see him because... It was it was like just to walk through the doors of the care home and to open that door into his room and not knowing what that day would be like. It was like uh, it was powerful, and that's why I wrote the, the first chapter, dedicated and wrote it about dementia. So it was a, an eye opener. It made me grow up a lot. It made me realise, you know, there's more. You know, life's precious, and whatever time you've got, with, whether it's with your family your loved ones, your best mates, like, like you've got to just, you've got to embrace it. You've got, you've got to wake up every morning and think, you know what, I know money's, money's the root of all evil because it is and people greed and everything, but when you can look in the mirror and you've still got your health and you can still do things like that other people can't do, you're a very, very lucky man like us, you know what I mean? Yeah. How is it though when you kind of look at your life and obviously you loved your dad, but then you look at the things because my biggest regret was my dad never got to see me at my potential. I was just out of the jail. He's he my dad my dad got diagnosed while I was in fucking Berlin. And then a part of me blames myself. Was that the stress he's yeah. seeing his son putting on him? And then before he died, he said to me, Look, get your act together, son. Yeah. I was on the weed valium at the time, sniffing gear, yeah. fucking booze. Because I couldn't handle the pain that I'd fucking let them yeah. down as well. So you, you, you do all yeah, the self medicate exactly to bring it up. So when he died, he never got to see my greatness. He never got to see my yeah. me shine. People say he was still with me. I don't believe that. I believe that he can see it. Pro, ho, ho, listen, I hopefully, but no, I, ever, I, I believe in uh, there's an afterlife, and, and yeah. I've gone to mediums and I've read messages, and and uh, my dad had this gift about him, and he knew stuff. I, you know, I could never lie to him. He's like. He knew like, what was going to happen to me. It, it's a real weird thing, this connection. But the hardest thing I ever did, which is, I spoke about in the book, and it's, it's only now that I don't get really upset, like, is the, my, my daughter was there, my sister, and we, we was all in the room, and he was just sleeping, and he, he was just, he was in pain. The sores, like, watching him being fed, and, and, and like, I'm, I'm a coward. I, 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 I have to walk out of the room. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, instead of sitting there with him, and I would, I want to run away from it. And that's what you, what you just said. And, and you do run away from it because you smother the pain with something else. Mm -hmm. And so you, it makes you forget. And then this day, and I just said to my sister, my, my youngest sister, Sunny Mimi, and I went, um, like, can, can everyone leave me alone? I want to talk to Dad. She said, he's not talking. I went, he, he, he's talk, he will be talking. I said, just, can you all go out? He had this little, back doors open onto and like there was a garden there and it, down, and it was a beautiful place it was, it was in like up near Upminster and uh, I held his hand and I was uh, he, he had a good head of hair and I was running my fingers through his hair I'm going you alright dad and he go and that's me so he go yeah boy I said uh, I went to him I thought do I say this am I a bad person I went I said dad I said uh, you tired didn't you and he went, yeah, boy, like that, like whispered it. And I said, I said, you know, you don't, if, you, if you're tired, you can go to sleep. You know, you can go a big sleep. How do you tell your dad that if he wants to move on? How do you tell that person you love and respect with all your heart that, that you could to, to go? It's, if you want to go, just go like that. You know what I mean? I said, like, I'll, look, mum's there. I'll look after. Everyone be looked after. I said, I said, but, but I said you're tired. I said, you, you, I said you, you can go big sleep. Do you want to go big sleep? And I thought, and I was getting lumpy, and I wanted like, and I'm trying to be strong because to let him know that I'm. And he went, yeah, boy, yeah, boy. He said, yeah, yeah, I do. And I, I was running, and I went, I said, look, I love you with all my heart. I'm getting thinking. I said, I love you with all my heart, and I, went, I kissed him. I did. I said, if you, if you do it, I said it's all right to go to sleep. I, I just, how do you say to to that man? It's all right to die. You can't say it in them words. It's not something you say to, no one wants their parents to die. You don't say it. So mm -hmm. I thought, I 
that, that these words would come across like right and he would understand where I was coming from. So I went, I love you, I'll, I'll, I'll be back and see you. But I said, I said, you know, if, if you've had enough, because he did say to me in, at the hospital, I've had enough. And I knew once he stopped talking and communicating. So I went, next day we took it in turns like, like my daughters go down there and all that and then uh, then the day after which I was going to go like my, daughter, uh, my, my three oldest daughters they looked after him when he we, like took him out and my mum weren't well so they'd go round they'd do the cleaning they were, they were like their little angels do you know what I mean like my Carly Jamie and Jodie and, and they, they uh, my dad idolised them they used to ruffle his hair up we love you grand <laughs> and they'd sneak him out to go to, for, to the pie mash he'd go don't tell mum she'd go mate don't tell her will you like that because like he, and he'd go no 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 come granddad would you just say going around the shop and then they'd take him to pie mash or a bit of fish and chips and he just loved the old traditions like that. so when my daughter rang up it, I think it was my Jodie my third youngest and she was screaming like no Jamie she, I think it was one of them and then she went Granddad's dead, granddad's dead. Like screaming down the phone. And I went, uh, 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 you gotta get down here. So like I was in the car and I think it was a wherever I was, it was about three quarters an hour, fifty minutes drive. I think I was in South End at the time and I'm driving to Upminster, so could have been forty minutes, but it seemed like forever. So I was driving, but you know when you're going in over your mind, like what I said and everything else, and then I started judging myself. Like was I wrong? Did I say the right thing? Is he in a better place? So I said, what happened? And then I said, because they said, I love him. They said, do you know what? The only, he, he said, he's absolutely, because some people can get quite violent. Or she said, he, even till his death, he was such a gentleman. He always said to elder hands, like, anyway, thank you. And he go, please. And, and that's, he wouldn't hold the conversation. They said, he's such a lovely man. And he said, they went in there half seven in the morning, got him up, changed his thing, got a clean T-shirt on, put the blanket over him, and gave him his breakfast. And then they walked out and they come back and he, he, he just he went in his sleep. Yeah, that's a good way to go, man. And, uh, you know, when I got there and just, it, <coughs> yeah, just went in and kissed him because everyone just turned up. But yeah. I'd already done my thing and uh, I never told the girls or I never told anyone. It was months, months later till I, I said what I said. But I felt that I think a lot of people don't grab it by the horns and fight like, and, and explain it and what I did and the reasons I did it, you know what I mean? The way I, to do that thing, you know, whether people say, oh, you shouldn't have said that, you should. No, said, because no. my dad was suffering. I don't think because I, I loved him. Yeah, my dad James. was suffering. I, I wanted him to go. In your mind, you think they're Superman. The thing yeah. is, you think they're going to change. They're going to wake up one yeah. day and they're going to be, be normal, normal every morning. Because before the night before my dad died, I was speaking to him. Brand new conversation. And the next day we woke up, he was out of the game. The doctors and nurses came. And the funny thing is, they're, they're still aware in the brain when you die the brain's still active for seven minutes but before he went everybody's in the room crying the aunties come the uncles come and um, it's when everybody left the room he went because they don't want they can only leave when there's no much grief yeah, there yeah. they need to go in peace yeah. they need everybody to be calm that's why they'll normally go when nobody's crying there was no one there he'd done it before the visiting hours because mm -hmm. all the girls would have turned up and there would have been people there yeah and it was not the, the following day it was the day after and and i'm glad not glad i can say you're glad you know what i'm saying like he, he weren't screaming or in pain or like laying there in agony he, he decided to he, he had his breakfast, he loved his food, and I thought, you've had your breakfast, Dad, make sure you're full up, put your head down, and you've closed your eyes, and you've slipped into that. That's sleep. the thing, I've been around so many people who have took their last breath, family members, friends, and when they take their last breath, they're not going in pain, it's like a relief. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. It's like, fuck. Well, to go on with now, my partner, Joe, like, uh, she lost, God rest her soul off, and I've, I've known her, 38 years since she's 17. She's 10 years younger than me. We've, we've seen each other not five years. Always loved her. So we're like, I always had this relationship, like mates. She was married to my best mate. Like, she was like, we was, and 
always stayed each other. We always sort of said, love you, and which never, nothing ever happened. And then we did see each other a few years ago. I knew her family, her, like I knew them, so I knew her dad and all that. And she had been to her, as this, this is, this is our life, mad is. Like, it was, it was a Friday. Uh, yeah, and it was a day they had four brothers and one sister. And uh, his oldest brother, I think it was his, uh, yeah, on that Friday, he was, he'd got taken into hospital when he wanted to be at the funeral. He's never missed none of the funerals, right? He was in hospital and he's on the day before he said to her brother Stephen, like, I, I want to be at my, my brother's funeral. I want to be, and he couldn't get out of bed. He was, he was in so bad. He, he, he was like in a right state. His organs were giving up and everything. And, um, Joe was at the funeral of her uncle. So she'd had a few drinks, the after drinking and everything. So I've got to hers, just chilled out. And, I, and I, I was on antibiotics and everything. I was right rough that week, but I was just chilling out. She was still talking about the day with the family and all that. And it was about 10 o'clock. And she said, oh, I've had a couple of calls with Miss Calls from the hospital. And um, I know she's a bit of a morbid podcast but it's I don't know. <laughs> well, involved in fucking murders and yeah great. that's his, that's well, his PG it's, it's, it's about life, how, yeah, his life how yeah. we and I had to share that experience what you just said and the hospital rang and said you need to come into the hospital she said why she said we can't tell you but she, you you should come now but she said she'd had three missed calls at from the hospital when she was at the funeral but didn't realise because they never had messages and nothing like that so she, they, they've called and she said, I said, well, ask them. Like, I've, she said, they won't tell me what's going on. So I just come get ready and, and I like, I've got jumped in her car and it was about fucking about an hour's drive. It, it was really, really foggy and it was pitch black. We had to go all through the country lanes to Arla. And we got there and her dad was there and her, 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 her older brother. Uh, a niece and nephew, and uh, a couple of like family, family members, and I said, and I was watching him the way he was in, in the bed, and it, it was like looking at my dad. This is what I said to her, and she had, she was guilty and all that, and I went to her, whisper, well I whispered, I said, if your dad is like, that, I went, to her, you've got to be strong. I said, he won't, he doesn't, he won't know, he won't recognise me, he won't know me, and I went, to her, I said. I guarantee you, but I never see him enough. I never took the effort I did take the time because I was like, she was a single mum and thing. I said, he will know it's you. He will want you there. Like my dad, there's one sister and one brother. Like, her brother's the old brother like me. And my, I went, I said, just say, whisper him in his ear, say your goodbyes, right? I said, and just say a certain thing to him. Anyway, he's there and he's like breathing, like struggling and all that. And I pulled Stephen out of brother and I went, like, like I've seen this, I went, I said, he's going, he's dying. And he went, I guarantee you, he stayed alive to, and waited for you two to be here. And he went, oh, I said, I'm just, I'm just marking card. I wasn't being brutal, James. I was being honest with my own experience and caring. So Joe's gone off to a son's at uni, and, no, so he couldn't be there. So she's walking down the thing, and all of a sudden the nurse went, oh, no, that. And I went, Joe, get back here. And I was standing in there, and me and Stephen were talking, and you know that last breath where they go, <gasps> yeah. But before she walked off, I made her go say goodbye, and she kissed him, and she and I could see her running her fingers through his hair, and it reminded me of my dad, and um, it brought it all back to me. Then I had to be strong for her because, like, I'd experienced that, and then she was in pieces, and then we had that drive home, yeah, but. You, we got there and within 40 minutes they, and they, they'd been trying to get hold of them all afternoon but because of the funeral so what I told her to say and she said it she said oh, I'm so glad you was there she said if it weren't for you she said like and being having you back with you or whatever and having that person she said who oh, I've always loved she said I'm, I'm so glad you was there with me in that moment See, when you kind of go through that, because you've lost people your whole life, that's the one certain turn life you're going to lose people, including myself. Like I said earlier, with the regret I had with my dad, do you ever regret the worry you put your own dad through? 
what my lifestyle yeah because that's the thing that fucks me up because you know what? the life that i've got now my dad would have loved he would have loved to been sitting here yeah. with you all the guests he'd be behind it he'd be talking about it for yeah. to everybody he would have fucking loved but it he never my got dad, to see my dad's that like, he'd been he'd, my dad like never judged me but i told him everything all from my life i'd said to him i'm doing this and i've had i used to get get, get the, the the end things and he'd hide them and like, look after them and do that at his bungalow and he'd, he'd do stuff for me he always covered me ass and he's gone now but he never ever judged me never said like don't he let me get on with my life and do it as long as he's he always said to me as long as i don't ever want to bury my own child that's the only thing he ever said to me he said i, I never want to be i would never want to bury one of my children and I and I took that point in like being that because I knew like he was basically saying that would that would destroy me, uh, that would destroy me if I had to take one of my my own kids and I get that. So, but he would he'd be sitting here with me, you, and I could take you around now. Like if he was alive now, go go to his little flat, like his mason it, and go in there. Go, I got me mate James, and he go, all right, boy. Yeah, I sit down. Want a cup of tea? Want a sandwich? And he goes, oh, son, how are you? And he sit you down. He goes, well, what do you do for a bit of work? How are you? Do you know? And that's how he, he was a proper little character. Everybody loved him. So he would be love it sitting here now, like you, like you said, with your dad and my dad sitting here listening to us two telling stories and talking. Yeah. Does it make you reminisce? Yes. Especially the life that you've read, like I yeah. say, you were proper. No matter what anybody says, yeah. you lived that life. Yeah. You fucking lived it, and you were upfront about it. There was no stone unturned. You didn't back down. And um, do you see when you get older though, and people start firing shots, does that frustrate you because you know who you used to be? Yeah, yeah, of course it does. Yeah, yeah, because like when there's there's people coming out of the woodwork now 29 years 30 years after they've gone and saying to me you need to come on my thing you got to talk to me and all that i ain't got to talk to no one i'm 65 listen if you want to fucking come knock on my door i said i, I said i guarantee you, you won't get out my fucking door i swear i swear on my children's lives and anyone goes near my kids my family i i don't care how old i am i will fucking still give my life life like i've lived my life if i die tomorrow I will die of a grin on my face. You know what? Because I've lived it three, four times over. I've done people in this world like they, they read the books and me. That that's nothing. That that the, the film is not even that much of my life. People don't even know the real truth of what I've done, been and done. Right? I've done some things, some naughty things, but then I've done it to make my life better and give my kids what I never had because my poor background. But people won't get that. And people go, oh, you never did this, you never did Because what? Because I didn't stand there and talk about it and brag it. Because I never went, oh, well, I've done this. I, I wouldn't fucking tell anybody. If I, if, I, if I had killed anyone, or if I had shot anyone, or if I had stabbed, what, do you think I'm going to go public and impress people by saying that? No, go fuck yourselves. But if you want, want it with me, I'll still fucking give you my last breath. When were you ever like your happiest, Carlton? Ah... Uh, Laughing and joking with my dad when he was alive, aggravating the fucking life out of him. I'd go round there, even when he was, I, I just used to wind him up and he used to make me laugh because he'd go sitting there and go, All right, dad. I'd go, like, um, I said, I said, I've been West Ham, have you? I went, Yeah. I said, Have you been watching the telly? He go, Why, well, what's happened? I went, We fucking won the league and we had the FA Cup. He went, Nah. He went, You never told me because he started telling me football because those years when I, and then like, and I'd, and I'd give him a newspaper in the hospital when, when he just started deteriorating. And he always read, read the, the Sun every single day. He had, I'd, I'd take his newspaper and get it. And this day he had it upside down. But I just had to say to Mickey, I'd go, what's happening, Dad? What's happening? And, he, he's, he's, and he's pretending to read it. And he had to bless him. He had the paper upside down. And just winding <laughs> him up, like messing his hair yeah. up and, and, and joking with him and just telling him like little porkies and all that, you know what I mean? And my girl, girls go, why do you wipe granddad up? Leave him alone and all that. Do you, miss, just, do you miss the West Ham days, Carlton? Because I had an old Bill Gardner on uh, yeah, maybe two or three years ago. Legend. Just proper and again, staunch man. And I think it was, he was, he was, he, I think he, it was he, Tiny from Millwall who wanted to speak yeah, to him. Yeah, Tiny I see was it. on his deathbed. Yeah, and, um, do you know what? And that man's a fucking gentleman. He, he, has, me up. he has backstory. Bill's yeah, homeless, yeah. street fighting. Yeah. Like... 
a proper legend, and you could see the emotion in his Do eyes. You know what? I've I've, I've been in the underworld. He 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 made me. The, 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 when he took me under his wing at sixteen, I was about sixteen at West Ham, and like he, he sort of picked you out. You was hand picks, and if he had you and you was with him, like he had this thing about him, and I, and I've seen that man. He would never use a tool. That man was a fighter, but he never went in. He could have gone in the underworld. He could, he could have done like any doors. He could have been. He, he the man was, a, he was a leader. He was a general. He was Mister West Ham. When it comes, forget all the hooligans in the world. He was known all over the country. And I've travelled. I've been by his side, like been to, to all over the country and stood with him, like been caught out, been stood on my own, you know, like, and fucking made me go in Middlesbrough's end. We've all tried to take the end. Like, it's just me and him. I went, fucking, I was 17. I went, Bill, I went, I went, I said, we're in the end. And all oh, West Ham got stopped at the service doors and all fighting and all that. And I went, oh, West Ham, West Ham. So we got in there and all And he went, ah, oh, we'll be all right. He went, don't worry about that. I went, Bill, I said, we're going to die. I said, we're going to get, my arse was going, suck it out. And I just thought, I went, I can't leave him. Because you just don't do it. You've got to stand with him. If he stands, and if he takes God, you've got to do it. That's part of part of the the initiation of being with him. Is that's the way it is. He never tell you to do it. Never say yeah. if you went, you went. He would never. But he he, he knew who was a. And I was like, I said, Bill. He went. We'll be all right, boy. He said, Don't worry about that. So the fucking there was like this circle started to appear around us. Like this is in their North Bank, and I went like. And there's fucking, fa I'm thinking, fucking hell, Bill, we'll do something, mate. So what's he do? He undoes his fucking, he had the green flying bomber jet, gets his West Ham scarf out, zips it up and goes, I'm forever blowing bubbles. And I'm going, I'm forever blowing bubbles. <laughs> but I feel I've blown more bubbles out of my arsehole. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this they've just gone like that. They fucking thought, like, two men, and it was like, 10,000 in the end or whatever, I affected. They just wouldn't come near us. He's standing there, like, going, just, just looking at them all. And cause he was a big man, you know what I mean? Like, you met, he was taller because he sort of hunched over here. And then all the police come in. I thought, thank fuck for that. You know when you want to get nicked? <laughs> like, but they've grabbed hold of us. And them days, they never sort of like threw you. So they, they walked you down. He went over the pitch and you'd walk along the, the, the bit on the side to go to the way end. And they put us back in the way. We went, oh, we got in here by mistake, the wrong end. <laughs> like, they fucking know. And then by the time I got the other end, there's all the West Ham fans going, yeah, singing our name, bro. And I was fucking getting taller and bigger. My chest was out, you know what I mean? And I was the I was a fucking hero, wasn't I? But I never left his side. So, but I've been with him when he's had fights, and mate, that man can have a terror. But he never took a liberty with no one. See, if like he had a row, he banged someone out of fight, like they were a bit firm. Even if we were outnumbered, if you went to kick someone or, 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 or take a liberty with him, he'd go, whoa. That's enough. He's done. Leave off. He, 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 he tell you off. And you go, oh. Because you know what it is like when you're young, someone go like, oh, you're fighting and other you want to get, you want to kick, kick the gun out of them, didn't you? No, you wouldn't have that. he go, boom. Do you miss those days? Huh? Do you miss yeah. those days? Them days, the, the late 70s and early 80s, when it all started up, before like, pre-ICF, it was the TBF, the Teddy Bunter firm, but like Bill Cum, he was like off, off speed from the mile in and, and we had our own firm in the chicken run the, with the West Side. But just great. Just fucking like, I can remember things like as vivid as anything, you know? Mm -hmm. How was the Genesis nights? Brilliant. Well, it just... That was just something else. It's just like because you were you you weren't a bouncer, were you? you? You did you get called in because you were ICF? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it did we was doing in a club on um, the Marlin Road called the Stairs? You spit the old Nashville's, and we were doing. We was all up West Ham, and then Colin, his his stepson, was one of the promoters, Wayne, and uh, he said, "Look, they're getting like." They they started doing these raves, like illegal raves, and little firms are trying to move in on them. Because, like, it was building up. They just started get, getting into warehouses and people, they were brilliant and they organised them. Well, they were the first, right? And people could see the money. So when you see money, people want a part of it and that's the way it is. So they said to us, can you put a firm together? And we did. And there was about, f there was 13 of us, yeah. Uh, but I would say f 
10, 10, 11 of us were West Ham, yeah, and a couple of other mates who did go football, but were, like were the doors of us, yeah, but we, we was, yeah, it was all ICF, like West Ham, yeah. How strong was ICF back then? Was it the strongest firm? <laughs> Listen, we, we could have got beat, I just think we were the gamest. I just think everybody, like, there was a time, like, uh, with the older lot, everybody knew everybody, and by name, you knew the faces. If there was a hundred of you on the train, like in it when we first started off going up to it and when we knew, never took big group, if there was 150, you knew everybody by first name, everyone's capabilities, who would be at the front, who would be at the back, who would be in the middle. It was, it was like military, but like most of us could all have a tear up. We were all street fighters. Like, with, and like when you, when you grow up in the East End and you've, you, you take a lot of, I was bullied at school, so I used to regularly take a good idea from the older boys the way I looked, so I was geeky, get smashed up. So getting a right hand out or getting, getting a kick in didn't bother me. And I was beaten quite a lot as a youngster because my mum was hard and like, if you'd done anything wrong, it would be like a, a wooden hanger, a belt or a slipper. And, you know, so I was always, and then my little sister, if she'd done one, I thought, well, I'll take the beating. Because if we, if we misbehaved and something got broke, it'd always be me. So I got used to it. So, and I think, Anyone that can take pain and take a punch ends up being a good fire. You know when you see these world champions who go in there and they don't lose and they go bang, bang, bang and knock out so they, and they, they think they're invincible. But as soon as they get one on the chin and they go over, it fucks them. It's that bully mentality like, because they think they're undestructible. Untouchable? Yes, yeah. Does that shape you to who you become? Most definitely. When the bullying kicks in, the beatings yeah. where... Yeah. You kind of have a fuck it button. But you, uh, I've got this like dark side where I, I still switch over uh, and I'm that temper is it, it's self-preservation. When you come from like, everyone wants brothers. I never had a brother, I had a younger sister, so I looked after her. I protected her. And I was like, to this day, like uh, uh, going through the last stage of the cancer, which we'll get on there, is you have to survive. And when you're in the East End, it was like everyone had there could be families of five, six, seven. It was all big families in the East End. We was like, what some of the smaller families. To have two kids was quite like a small family. You know what I mean? But in them days, most most families would there'd be five, six, and a lot of times they'd have like three or four older brothers. So if you had a fight with someone at school and you beat them, then you'd have the, the next brother, and then the brothers would come looking for you because everyone knew everyone and with a name like Colton fucking I didn't have many hiding places did I mm. everyone was called Dave Steve John Alf or whatever so everyone knew who I was so I just had to fight keep fighting back fighting back until I win, won when you talk about the dark side when you switch did that come later in life once you had enough or was no, it always in you I think I always had in me I had this temper like this anger because I wouldn't say no I wouldn't go down when the old boys would like, I'd go outside and you'd have a strike after school and, they, and, they, and they'd say, stay down, stay down. And I'd get up and get up. And then they'd go, stay, you've had enough, you've had enough. And I'd get off the floor. I'd, I'd, and, then, and, and I think that there, there, there's something in you that, when I say the dark side, there's that, you've got to have that anger. It's like the good and the bad, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think everybody's got that, but it's just yeah. channeling into it and how it's how, knowing how to control it, yeah. yeah. Which is because when, like, when I always switch, it's like I, I, I sort of like I lose it and they're blackouts, if you know what I mean. What happened with the Marvin Herbert when I seen the video and you put the axe over his head? How true is that? <laughs> we weren't an axe, but he says his neck. He was laughing about it in a video. There was axes there and everything, but like I've I know Marvin since he was youngster, I loved him like that, but he, he was a live wire, trust me. And he was game as a bike, all right? And he's a character. He's been barred so many times and he's come down on his birthday. I've got him <laughs> back in Ministry of Sound, got him in. He's turned up this night. He bounces. He's loud. He's a bouncer. He's like, he's like a fucking kangaroo. He's jumping about everywhere, all, like, all lively. <clears throat> I thought, like, come on, get in. I said, come behave yourself tonight. I said, oh, like, they, they, they told me to ban you. Oh, I'd always let him in because like, I had that soft spot. So next thing I know, um, well, Fatty was there. That night, you know, we were talking about the bomb, right? And he denies he was there. He come down with Dave Dunn to, to, to meet me. This is 1990. And he wanted a job on the door. And I went, I don't know you, mate. I said, like, I said, it's closed school. My, my, at my doorman, 
we've all grown up together. We all know our history, whether we're football or on the streets. And we and I said, there ain't one person here. And I've known Dave like through West Ham, and he got go, and he went. I said, so there ain't a job here like that. But he's come down like with a he's he's probably in white shirt and black trousers, dressed like a doorman. Anyway, so I said, go inside and all that, have a walk round and have, have a night in there. But I said, I'm not, I'm not taking no one on at the moment. So he's gone in there. Next thing I know, the door would come out. Cole, Cole, I was at the front and on the radio, I was going, it's kicking off, it's kicking off, someone's been stabbed. So I said, someone's been stabbed like that. And I went, oh, what the fuck's going on here? Because ministry weren't really that tight a place for that to happen, you know what I mean? Unless I've done it, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. Um, so, uh, so I've sort of gone into the, the, the entrance and then I fucking seen my doorman all grappling with, with Mar Marvin. And I thought, oh, fuck Marvin, of all people. Well, what the fuck? And he's like lost it. He's fucking like absolutely gone out of his nut. Like gone, gone. And he's got like, he said he's pulling like tools out of knives, fucking this and that. So I've got him, got him, I said, got him again, get the thing. And it, uh, He's, he's gone to pull a blade out, CS gas, and, well, he told me oh, he had a fucking piece in his, his thing and he was going to pull it out. So I was, I was trying to get him hold him, and I, so I went to him like, he would not not listen, like, he fucking, and then he was going, ah, me, and all that. So there was a weird little cage thing where we kept everything on the side. So I just put, put him in the cage, in with me, and then I got, like, I took, well, I said it was nine by, he says next, whatever, whatever I grabbed. And I just went to him, and he, he was like, he was frothing in the mouth. He was like a rabid dog, honestly. You could not control that man. And I just fucking, and then everyone was trying to hit him and fight him. He was just fighting everybody, all that dog, but he didn't give a fuck. He was only, he just did not give a fuck. So I've just gone bang, 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 done him, like, and I thought, it's the only way to do it. I've got to fucking, I've got to do it. Because, like, it, I knew it was the only way to stop him. Because he would have, he would have killed someone that night. Then, I, so, he, he was gone and all that. So as someone I knew, I went to him, like, pull your car around the back exit. I said, get, his head was all split. I went, like, even though, like, like that, I went, make sure he gets to the hospital. And they pulled their car around and he got took out of the back exit, put in the car to go to the hospital for treatment. I thought, and, he went, and then I went, like, he went, he's the geezer who'd done the stabbing. I went, who's he stabbed? He went, remember the big fat geezer that come in, like, the big lump with the, the thing? He... There, there's a rag on on wherever it was. Then my doorman gone over to deal with it. He's made himself busy, gone over, <coughs> trying to act like a doorman. Marvin's gone to him, who the fuck are you like? And he went, blah, blah, blah. so he's gone bang, stabbed him in the stomach. But he ran out the back exit, crawled out the back exit, he got stabbed in the stomach. He denies that. Marvin knows it was him. I know it was him, and all my doorman do. But when I've put it in the book, and I, which is in there that moment, I said, don't fucking tell you about all them, them days and all that, like where he was Mr. fucking, Mr. Essex. And I, he went, no, he said, oh, what I've done, I, I was in Ministry of Sound. He said, I was walking back, <coughs> and they all, five black geezers see me, and there was a shop, and he said, they thought I was a, one of the doormen, right? So they tried to jump me, right, on his own, right, that... He's on the industrial site. There ain't even his shops. He went, they've got hold of him, punching him, and he, he put one through the fucking window. He's done another one. He's hit him, and they've all run off. Five black geezers. Could you imagine that? In South London, running off, and it's just him. And he said, that's what happened. And he said, and like, I got like cut. He said, that was from an opera. And he denies it's this day. And that is the truth. I will swear on my dad's ashes, as I look you in the camera. I wouldn't, I don't take his ashes like, I was fucking there and I know that happened. And that's another one of his lies. So that was Marvin who stabbed Burnley? Yeah. Why would he deny it? Because he got done. He was, yeah, but he, 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 he thinks he's, he thinks he's untouchable. He thinks he's like fucking this Mr. Hard man, but he's a dog. So with all that, it's been messy for years with you, Terry, Stone, Bernie, like, where did it all, where does it all stem from? Right. What is this like, the story the, the, the at the start? The true story, which, which I've never said, and, people, and, I've, and I've, I've just kept it to myself for different things, right? Me and Terry Stone were mates. I've known Terry for years. I was, at, I, was at, I used to do Royal Ascot security there, me and my foster brother, Sid, and I'm doing the things. He come in, and he said, I, I had a book, and it was, uh, I took, they were our backs. Muscle had just come out. So I said, I've got one copy left, and it was for someone. And he went, oh, can I, I said, do you want that copy, Terry? And he went, yeah, can you sign it to me? Signed it to him. 
And then he rang me a few weeks later. He said, I've spoken to a couple of people. He went, this is mate, a blinding film. He said, we'll have a meet at Marrakesh, which is his restaurant. He's already sold on, on another podcast that he, I was just a, did a bit of door work and I was just a football hooligan, right? I was just nothing really. But he bought my book and he made me because he bought my book and turned it into a film. No, my book was the start of the franchise. I started the Rise of the Foot Soldier. They, you got the part of fucking Tony Tucker because I, I told, I helped you get that part. Do you know what I mean? So you, that's the part you wanted to play. So it was all right. And he, 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 I'd done the deal with him. He changed the deal and he went to me. I was supposed to get a chunk of money and there were some royalties. He went to me, take less money, which is 20 grand less than what you was going to get. I'll tell you what it was. It was 30 grand for my story, right? He said, what we'll do, take 10. He said, we've gone with another film company. He said, like, obviously, in the economy. He said, take 10 instead of 30. 30 was a lot of money then, like 2006. A lot of money to have 30 grand to sell a story, for, you know. And then he went, he said, um, well, you need for months. Then we'll give you the royalties and all that. So basically, he chipped me for me a bit of dollar. It, it was a cult film, and they, they, they to this day they still say it, it's still they didn't make any money. What's a load of bollocks? But what he did in 2007, I started. He got pally with, with Bernie. Now I'd heard, I'd had my, my cards marked about him that he, he was a wrong man. He, he he moved into the Essex for certain reasons, to, and he was a grass and different thing, and something went right about him, right? There was people, people like, where did this man appear from? A brummy, all of a sudden, he, he, he's in the heart of Essex, whatever. Right, so I said to Terry, I went, what are you doing panning up with him? And he, Terry done two films, Bonded by Blood, one and two, you know, two fucking best British films of all time. Obviously not. What did he get in with him? I said, tell. I went, he's a fucking wrong one. Like, I thought we're friends. Well, I'm an actor. I went, a fucking actor? He went... I'll, if, if I had to play a pedophile or a grass or anything, I said, it, that's my job now. So I, I can't, I'm not going to do it. And I, and I said to him, like, you, if, if you're his friend, you ain't my friend. And that's basically what I said to him. I said, we can't be friends. And that was the, re the reason I never, after that, I never spoke to him again and didn't want nothing to do with him because he was making him a grass, like, and it was, and it was told uh, uh, on, the, on the circuit, if you know what I mean. That he was a wrong one, and he, he he went well. If he is, he is, and he. So to me, I thought you ain't got no no morals or principle. You know what I mean? You're you're just like the rest of them, the pan out. When did Terry start acting? I don't know. He, uh, no, he done Rolling with the Nines, which was made the year before. Rise of the Foot Soldier was a great movie. Yeah, man. yeah. It's a, it's a fucking uh, great movie. I think Some of them. He, I know there's about what I think six. He just made a couple of. Films I know there's six, six or seven. I, I, I Terry know. is an actor. Listen. There's not much work in the UK. If no. there's Rise of the Foot Soldier 30, yeah. he's still going to be playing yeah. the part. Yeah. And it's understandable. He actually but, thinks he's Tony Sucker. Is, um, so, he, he believes in his head that he is Tony Sucker reincarnated. I'm sure he does. With the wigs and everything and the, and the behaviour. He asked me how Tony was, what he was like. He's never heard Tony talk. Tony was a fucking gentleman. He never go, you can't be fucking slag or fucking like the way he portrays him. Like, like, and I was talking to my jo about it. She went, he, he just actually makes him look, but everyone who actually knew Tony, yes, he did wrong things. They did do some bully things, but he wasn't a loud mouth. He wasn't a gobby like the way he portrayed him. Like, I swear, if you always see your missus or anything like that, he, he was the perfect gentleman. If he was in company, he would never go over the top like he, he did. So he don't even know Tony Tucker. He's never met Tony Tucker. Tony Tucker was dead. So he, he had to rely on information from the likes of me to play that part. So see, when you, did you sign the rights away to the movie? What what was the deal that you signed? Well, you well, Julian knows more about that because like when we when we read it, we used to book. Were muscle. you naive to that? Because yes, I know people. I did. So, I didn't have a fuck. Yeah. Like, so as got, for Terry and whoever the business yeah. is, 
they've seen uh, they fucked me because of my naivety yeah so it's animal people who's written books yeah and they've seen the whole fucking and documentaries movies yeah, possibly yeah, yeah. other books that come yeah, from yeah. it they've seen the rise away there's fuck all you can do yeah that's business same as the music yeah, industry yeah. and that's what that they make all, the producers make all the music yeah the singers they don't get fuck all no, they get a small they percentage the same with me. yeah so it's all numbers but is that what you feel that yeah as yeah. a friend, they should have yeah, guided should have you more. Me. Yeah, and and I'd my or was he just thinking, was he out there to fuck you, or was it a case of he didn't know well, either? Nah, I, I think he was there to fuck me, and he didn't give a fuck because it was about the pound out. I may be wrong. Tell if I'm wrong, I will apologise your face, but I ain't gonna ever apologise here because you're sitting there doing shows with grasses. How long were you friends with Terry? I'd known Terry for a few years, I think, like, for the racing he was promoting, and then Ascot, seeing him up that end where he lives, and everything, all the boys around there, you know what I mean? And, like, doing doing security over there, all the top boys that run it, uh, they all know him, he had Marrakesh. My my oldest boy was one of his doormen at his club, Marrakesh. My son worked on his door. So, uh, yeah, I've known Terry for a few years. Because I think he done a podcast and says you should have been thankful because he made your name bigger book sales and really? other films yeah as everybody's getting older man kids could they not be brushed under the carpet and dealt with nah really nah you know what it is if you want to think that if that's what you you get off at because I don't threaten you I don't go like that and I know I could go to I know exactly where he lives I know, I know where listen I know where all my enemies live I've, I've done that all my life and you still keep note of that I've got no getting written down and thinking it's not a threat, but if you're someone that keeps having a go at you, someone keeps digging you out, it becomes personal, right? I've only dug him out for, because of what he, how he's portrayed my best friend and humiliated him. There's no one to defend him. Like, I, he's my mate. I, I, that's what I've got to do. I've got to defend my best mate. The others two, I'm not bothered about, but Tony was my best friend. So if there's no one in his corner, if I wasn't in his corner, I've broke the bond that me and Tony had, the wish that we'd always have each other's back. So while I'm alive, if I can defend him, not defend the, the bad things he's done, but if I can defend him as a mate and not have him humiliated and had the piss taken out of, that's what I've got to do. Is that what you feel it's at now? Yes. What happened with the second movie, Rise of the Foot Soldier 2? Did you write that? Yeah, and me Yeah, me and Mickey went off to do our own movie, The Rain of the General, and Mickey was going to play me, but we didn't know in the small print, uh, like they said, all signed and dusted. Uh, we raised the money, and it was going to be called Rain of the General. It weren't going to be Rise of the Foot Soldier 2. Uh, Carnaby took us to court, uh, stopped filming for, after, for, for nine months. We had to go back. We're three quarters away from the film. They paid, uh, they got uh, Jonathan Sofcock, they got rid of him, who was the, uh, the, the behind it all. And it was going to be our own film. And I didn't know when they own the rights of Ricky playing Colton Leach. They don't own Colton Leach. They don't own my story. They don't own me because I've never signed my life away. But Ricky can never play Colton Leach unless it's in one of their films or their stories. He can play other parts or he could do something with me. But he can't be Colton. That he's he's in a small print, like you said. He's fucked. He can't never. He was great in the first movie. That guy. Yeah. Fucking yeah. great. Yeah. That, it's, it's one it's of the best. Like, yeah. It's you, one you of the say, best crime films, if I'm honest. You, and the alert kick and that was class. Um, the business. I, yeah. It's up there with them. But but the thing is, he spent nine months with me before we started. Thing. He actually travelled and uh, out of his own pocket. I took him on bits of work. I took him to, to, to strip clubs. I, I took him <laughs> to see the real life, the real things. I got him on the piss, got him fucking out. Fucking come back to my flat at like five o'clock in the morning, finished fucking, been to strip clubs, fucking out here, there and everywhere. Clubs, bars, all with my firm. Then I woke him up at eight o'clock in the morning. He's like, I went, mean, we were, I went, we're going on a bit of work. He went, well, oh, fucking what? It's eight o'clock in the morning. I went, I've got a mate to go to, um, uh, McDonald's, a certain place pick up an envelope. He went, I said, listen, if you want to know what I'm all about, I said, you've got to come with me now. I said, whether you get in at fucking five, six, or, or even seven o'clock, if you've got to be somewhere at eight o'clock, or get up at eight to go on to me, and there's a bit of graft, I said, you've got to do it. There's no, there, you, there's no time limit. You don't have eight hours sleep. If you make, you, so I took him, he was sitting at McDonald's, I got him a milkshake or a drink, and he was like that. 
And he's looking, he went, these, these Indian boys come in and some other little firm are all sit up around the table. We're having like the, the McDonald's breakfast and all that, chatting away. And all of a sudden they're like, fucking this, that, went across and like that. So I come out. I went, come, we're going. He went, he's, like, he's, he's gone, what do you mean we're going? He said, what do you mean we're going? I said, uh, we're uh, finished. He said, what did you do then? I went, get in the car. And I went, yeah. Got the envelope. I said, have a look in there. And he went, I was like, can't he? He went, there's eight grand. I went, yeah. That's my money. He went, I'll never see that go. Cause he went, why did I miss that? I said, because you don't know what you're looking at. That's my world. People don't just walk in somewhere and you have a meeting and go, hey, I've got you eight grand here. Here. 10, 20. It don't work like that. The envelope goes across. If they fuck you for the env for the money, though, yeah, then they're going to get fined. So, and it was done. The, the, the both parties were happy, sorted. And then he come up, trained with me, took him training. We done the weights together, like helped him. I have got all his um, protein stuff because he couldn't do steroids. And so my, my other mate, he's dead now. Uh, Rob Gregory, he, he gave him big pots of the, all the, the weight gain and all that, and he's trying with me, and he, and he made the effort to spend a lot of time with me. But when I watched the the, 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 the show in at Soho, like, and he was sitting next to me, I didn't realise the mannerisms. You know, when they pick up on certain things, the way you talk, he, that, I was shocked. I thought, oh, how did you, like, he must have been screwed after that, that, first meeting and taking he started scrutinising the way I talked I spoke the way my voice was the, my mannerisms do you know what I mean he was a cool little bastard yeah, yeah the, listen that, like I say yeah. it's a fucking great movie do you feel then disheartened that because like you say in this industry it's all business it's not the guys with the big scars and the tattoos six feet two skinheads no. it's the fucking guys in suits yeah. and the thing is you can't do fuck all because no. they're straight on the blow up to yeah. the coppers yeah. and um do you feel let down then by having the first one, you've then got something to then kick on, made the second one? Could you not have been in the second one then or was it totally you signed this agreement and you're bombed out? Was no, that the plan? No, because they, they stopped the filming because of the name Cut and Leach and Ricky Arnett. You sold your own name away? Yes. So my name was, was sold to him. Ricky Harnett. So that's it. That was their, 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 their old. How much was that for? 10 grand? Uh... No, what did we, 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 I think we got four or five hundred grand to make the film. They took it to call, uh, the, the film company, the, uh, the investors pulled out of it, Piccadilly, um, and, uh, Jonathan from Softcat went, disappeared because he was nicking money out of our film to pay the other film we hadn't paid off. So everything was going like all pear shape. So Andy Love Day just went boom, 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 gave the investors their money back, a drink on top for their investment. Paid us the rest of our money, like, and then basically owned the film. We had to sign new contracts and give them the film. So why couldn't you have all worked, worked together what? for the second one? Because they what? fucked me for the first one. Never yeah, that's what I'm saying. Was that the whole plan then? That just was the to, plan. to fuck you off. But why are you the name of it? <sighs> you are him. How much did the first movie pull in? Well, they don't say. They... Because they, they, DVDs and that back then, all yeah, my they, friends they, and Porso. Everybody had the DVD. Yeah, all my uh, boys and Porso were talking about everybody it back then. It. it was actually my wee pal Maury. And the cinema. It, 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 it took 800 and something grand at the cinema. I mean, I went I, I, I went to Basildon. It was quite funny. We, the film was just, we had the premiere and it went on general release. So I said, should we have a night out to Ricky? I went, let's go to Basildon, like the uh, festival park, and just turn up there, right? Big crowd, there was about 20 of us, right? And we'd just go and watch the film with, with all the normal punters. So we're queuing up. We paid for the tickets. We didn't say like nothing like that. So people were staring, and it's like a big foyer because you've got like 10 cinemas, 12 cinemas. There. It was funny as fuck because that's, that's my little buzz. So we've gone in and they're going, like looking, and then they're sort of like, you know, people were like whispering, and people were looking. And then we've gone in there and, and we've all sat like about, I don't know, about eight rows up, but big crowd of us. And people were looking over. Then the, the film was starting. They're looking at the film, looking over. But you know when they want to say something, and then a couple of people were there, went, that's you in that film, isn't it? And they went, yeah. I went, you're Colton, isn't you? They went, no, I'm not Colton. No, you, you're Colton. He went, no, he went, that's the real Colton. And then they're like that. And it was, but it was just, you know, when in funny moments, you, I had to do, yeah. How was life then, obviously coming from the ICF, 
the kind of Essex boys murders to then being a household name, a celebrity kind of thing. How was life? Were you, did, could you enjoy it? Or were you always have the, the... Because in your mind, when you come from a fucked up area and being around no. fucked up shit, you can never... The I happiness always it. gets took away. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So, and I don't want... I don't like that... That... Um, that... The... Status. Not, not, not the status of respect, yes. And in the world you live in, the fighting or the, or the hard man or being a good person, like right and wrong, black and white. So, but but that scene, the false scene of living the lifestyle, on, like being a celebrity, nah, that ain't me. I, I don't like it. It makes me feel physically sick. And when the people that are on that carpet or in them clubs and them corners you're mixing with, they're just fucking wrong and so I just don't like them. So how did the beef with, with Burnley start? What's the whole rundown? Because like, all these back and forths, year, many years later, like, is it not time to fucking flip the chapter and kind of everybody move on with their well, life? He, he, he won't move on. He just he just keeps, like, he's got another fucking Essex Boys thing, uh, Facebook. He's always he's always digging me out. He's always getting photos. He's making comments. He keeps going on Terry Stone's thing. Him and Terry Stone keep talking about me. Then they're going to they're gonna do a tour. The, the, the criminal podcast tour, uh, live podcast with an audience. He used to say, oh, fucking, I'll never fucking be seen dead doing an audience. I've been doing it since 2007. Like, always done them. You know I have. Yeah, I've done them. Like, all these years. And it, well, that's, that's coming up 18 years on the road. Have time off, then go back out. I went and done one a few weeks ago. I'll pick and choose. 120 people, free call seated meal, Ipswich, sold out. In, in for four days. So, you know, when you still, and, and I've just done the whole show by myself, I didn't even have a concert. I thought, I thought where's James or someone to help me? <laughs> but, you we know, we, like, because it was their first, they just started doing the shows. This guy, so I said, like, can you do it? I went, listen, I'll get up there, I'll do it all, I'll do the question. I've done the whole thing all night long by myself. But it, it's hard work because you need, the yeah, bounce someone off, bounce yeah, off. Yeah, 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 to work with. Because you don't like, realise how long it lasts up there. Yeah, and then you've got to come back and the questions and answers and then you need someone to walk around with a mic and help and, and with the things yeah. and, you know, like with you, it's, 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 it's easy because you you know the questions because you're dealing with that, that type of personal time. It, but, you know, it, comedians are normally the best that, who, who, who get the audience, like, you know what I mean? There's yeah. some great ones out there, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like Frank Allen and that, like uh, when he uh, he's scarcer. Best compare out on my shows the funniest man and the things he says to me hey, we don't get a right hand I don't know because but he's 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 mint mate mint but that's know. what comedy is all about yeah I love a bit of banter. yeah laughter yeah, laughter yeah. as the the key to anything but, in life but, but if, as like we did um like even his boy kept digging me out because because I brought that book out and I, I mentioned him in it who's boy uh, my book he, he yeah, but was boy be, and he Bernie's boy, Finney King. Right, so they, they were digging me out, like, like saying, oh, this is all bollocks, that's lies. And this. So I went, yeah. Then they got on Facebook, like, all that, counting me and all that and, and digging me out. So I was just putting them in a place, basically. Like, when they dug me out, I dug them out. And I, and I was dug up truths and th things and threw it back at him where he could, where I, I, where I know so much about him. And I thought, yeah, go keep on. And then, I, and then, so it was going backwards and forwards. Then, all of a sudden... His son's like fucking, uh, they've, oh, yeah, he's found out where I lived, right? F five o'clock in the morning, I got my me, me car on my drive, and uh, he's, he's driving because my curtains were shut, I was in bed, I didn't know. At the end of my drive, pulled up in his van, took a photo of my car, that fat bricks, put it on his, on his uh, Facebook, this is where that piece of shit lives, if anyone wants to go and do him, like this is, this is where you can get him. And I thought, you dirty no good cunt. What about my kids, my grandchildren, or if my, if any of my family staying there? You're telling my enemies where I am. Not that I give a fuck, because, listen, but what about the innocent people that are in that household? And then he has the audacity, like his son says I'm harassing him after calling me names and all that. What I did, basically, the, his son went on social media, he's social media, and we got all the photos he put up, being stupid stuff. He's, got, he's in a sex shop with his girlfriend, Right, who he's with at the time, right? He's got a double ended dildo as big as that. He's had his photo done with right? and he's put a big comment We're going to have some fun tonight. We're both going to use this. 
So I thought, you soppy long cunt. So I put it up, and I caned him. Wouldn't you cane him? Like, the funny side of it. He's then gone to Morden Police Station, uh, and other stuff, I think, all comments, saying that I'm harassing him and his family. And I thought... After taking a photo of your house? So, they've, so I've just got... I've got a list. I've gone to the police station. The police woke me up and said, well, you, you've got to come into Morden Police Station on harassment charges. I went, who have I been harassing? I went, Vin, Vinnie King, Vincent King. I went... That cunt's fucking don't stop digging me out. I said, have you had a look at social media? What he says about me? Well, no, he's he's put a complaint in, so we've got to investigate it. So I went, all right. So I, I went to my brief. I said, like, I said, because I've, I've had my brief for, like, he's, he's the absolute nuts, Sean, and I've, like, for 20, 25 years plus, and he's, he's he's got me off of a lot of things where I was innocent with. <laughs> no, he's, a, he's a nuts, mate. But anyway, so... I said to Sean, I went, I'd rather pay the money and get it done. I mean, so I've had to pay for the solicitors, then on, on the day, have a, have a duty, have a, have a e solicitor, then his top solicitor go with me, cost me a thousand pounds just go to the police station for an interview. So it's supposed to be a one to one with a, a, just a, I was just a chat. All right, all right, chat with me, right? So it's a uniformed copper and he's a video uh, thing. So I've gone in there. So he said, what are you going to do? The brief outside, one of my briefs. So he went, just do no comment all the way through. He said, we've got all your stuff. He went, it's absolutely ridiculous if they charge you with what he's saying over photos, taking the piss out of him. I went, I'm not bothered. I said, let them fucking do what they want. I said, let me take my call because I'll just fucking ruin him. You know what I mean? Because then I can say the, the truth. Anyway, sitting here, this plane closed, I'll be in here. And he just he said, oh, I'm just sitting in on the thing. This this copper's a new. I'm just it's a training exercise, and I thought I'm looking at her. I thought really, mate, really, <laughs> plain clothes old Bill sitting there. That what he's not trained. He, you got all the video equipment. You're doing a video interview, and I'm and I, and you're you're there as a training exercise. You're plain clothes. So I went all right. Yeah, fair dues, mate. So uh, anyway, he's, he's going. He's Polish, right? Which is quite funny. So he's a little bit slow because he's uh, he's going. Really where was you on the second of so by the time he's again the second i go no comment and then he's after him so every time he started the sentence i was going no comment so instead of letting him go right the way through i just went no comment no comment no comment like that so the cop was like the other cop was looking at me and i went oh i said can i have a break i said i've got asthma so i had my asthma pump and i said do i believe you on the tape he said you need the water i said if you want we can stop the interview anyone i said yeah i'll do suffer from anxiety so I'd done that one. I went, I said, so I might need to use it. Go out. He went, any time. He said, like that. He said, yeah, you're more than welcome. So then um, I went to say something a couple of times. And my sister went, no. I went, no comment. I went, there was a couple of things that come up where we were like a little bit naughty, what he was saying, like, like fucking trying to get me nicked, saying like wrestling him. Like after all the, all the people, him and his dad are bullied, women threatened on the internet and everything. And I got proof of it and all. So I thought, and then my sister went, well, I'm on the solicitor's thing. He said, what about, he's saying he's a rest. He said, like, and I never knew this. He said, this man, these, him and his dad, whoever took it, took a photo of his car on the drive outside his house, gave the address and put it on social media, right? That is the same as threats to kill. So he stopped the interview, the, the, the plane closed one. He went, that's a very, do you know what he's done? That's really serious. He said, forget this. He said, he said, do you want him nicked? I went, no comment. He went, we can deal with this. He said, if you want to chat with us, he said, because that is, I didn't know, apparently, that's like threatening someone's life and you, it, 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 you can get up to your mum's for doing that. If I went around and put someone's address, like took a photo and put it on social media and said to everyone, this is where a certain, certain person lives, their life becomes endangered because they've got enemies. It's like one of them, like an Osman woman. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. sort, but they, it's it's a serious charge. And he said, "Do you want us to deal with it?" I went, "No comment." I went, "No comment." Oh, no, I can't do it myself like that. So he just he just smiled and he went through and he went, "Well, well we've got to go to the the uh, CPS to see if they want to charge her." And I thought, "Oh, here we go." So that cost me like that was up to then. That wasn't that was seventeen hundred quid. I'd done on solicitors and that. But I thought, you know what, it's worth every penny. And then a 
couple of months later, got a letter. Uh, we will not be pressing any charges. Uh, there's no, there's no case against you at all. Right? He said I'm threatening it. Anyway, so that was the harassment one. Then within a few weeks, the fat daddy decides to take me to civil court. Um, and I've sent you the stuff over, and I, that you've read some of it. It's absurd, isn't it? Saying that his kids can't, uh, the, saying that I'm threatening his wife. Uh, I've been ringing his wife up. I've turned up in a car, threatened his kids, threatened him. He's a very ill man. He's, he goes to work. If you, if you read it, it's so laughable. That's why I sent you over because I read it. And I've got all the paperwork. And it, if, he, if he does keep on, it will go out there on social media. And you say you're not an informant or a grass. Well, to me, in my world, that's grassing. You took me to, to civil court. And then he, he fucks up so much. He put so much bollocks in there and all that. And the judge went, like Mr. Money, went, you've got to do this. You've got to gag him. He, he can't threaten me, he can't harass me and all. And he went, Mr Mahoney, he said to him, and he made me up, he went, what do you do? He said, do you not write books about crime and people's lives? Do you not get involved with it all? Have you not admitted being part of that world? He said, and now you want to arrest, get someone arrested or, 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 or nicks? He said, he said, no. He said, but, but he said, I'm asking you, you need to te gag, you need to need to put a gagging order on him and make so that so he can't talk, say mention my name or talk about me. He went, I don't think so. He said like that. So my my sister went like that, and he he got this thing out there, and he went back to the judge. He went under the section so and so so and so so. He cannot do the blah blah blah. He has not put the correct paperwork in. He has not approached you correctly, and he's telling you what to do. And he just they just threw it out. But that cost me five grand. But it just all seems child's play, like. Uh, both in your 60s I just, wouldn't take him to call in a yeah, but, years. but it just seems you, why you, not just let people go on with their life yeah. like you can't take a photo of someone's house nah. and then put it on social media it's fair if game I, if right, what he said in, in, in what you read what he said in, in a, a statement that uh, that I was ringing his house threatening his children threatening his family threatening them all would the police have not have pulled me in that's a serious matter if they had proof wouldn't there have been phone numbers which they could attract? Like, even if a burner, it would have given you the area it come from, Essex. Why didn't they pull me in? Why didn't they question me about these so-called threats? He said he'd, he's gone to the police, like, for protection, like, and all, whatever, and he's complained and all that. His kids are about to have been taken out of school because he said my crazed fans have been turning up at the school, threatening to stab, stab people. And he went, like... Uh, what, uh, well, you've read, you've seen it yourself. It's, it's fucking laughable. Will I ever get put to bed with, with the freeze, like you, Terry? Bernie, Bernie, if you're listening, mate, just put it to bed. Leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. You know what you've done in the past, what wrongdoings you've done. Crack on with your life, but just stop talking about me and making stories up and just trying to get one over on me. The only way you're going to get one over on me, put me in the fucking hole or come and see me. End of. What about Terry? Terry, you're just a prick. Why don't we set up a, a charity match? I've, I've said to him about doing it. I've, for over the 30 years, every time he's piped up about me, I went, so if you've got a problem with me, let's do it charity. Let's raise money for a good cause. Oh, I'm not childish. That's playground stuff. You won't get me. Well, you've got, you got Terry Stone. You've got, 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 got you, Fatty. Let's do tag team wrestling. And we, and we, 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 even, we do a comedy on And I'll tell you what, me and James are tied one of our hands behind each other's backs. So how's that? But no, we raise it for charity. Do something useful. If you've got a grudge, so fucking do it like real men do. That's the only thing. If you've lost your dad and lost your sister, lost loved ones, you realise life's too short to get yeah. caught up in the schoolboy yeah. stuff. Do you know what I mean? Are you want to just put it to bed and just let everybody, let bygones be bygones? Yeah, yeah. leave me alone. So as I say, Terry's an actor. He's doing his own thing with his podcast. Yeah. Bernie's wrote his books. Whatever anybody's got to say about anybody, just keep everybody out and go yeah. on with your lives. I think Bernie messaged me a couple of years ago. I think he's, he's struck down our podcast. I think it was photos that he says were his and then he play, put it back up. And, I, and everything was sweet. I said, no worries, man. Just I've no issues with anybody. Do you know what I'm saying? I've got my kids, my family. I just want yeah. to enjoy my life. Same as me. Do this business and, and create content. Yeah. That's it. I don't step in anybody's toes. I don't call people out. I could fucking destroy people yeah. left, right, and centre with the cult, cult following I have in all platforms. Yeah. I wouldn't fucking hold back, but I don't. I just, it's too draining. It's too tiresome. The only thing I, I had was running with him. I had a guy at Terry because the, the, both of them are, 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 are 
of, of, you know, they're both as bad as each other. They're now like formed this little partnership up. They're doing this tour, and you know, you're going to sit on stage, Colton this, Colton that. Oh yeah, he's this. He's never that. He weren't. A, he weren't this. He weren't that. Or this. I don't care. You sticks and maybe I was saying sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. They don't hurt me. Just let me get on with my life. I'm 65. I've got my, I've got my grandchildren. I've got my family. I want to make the most of it. I've just, my sister just got over cancer, right? Stage four. She had it in her blood and her lungs. And that, to me, is the best thing that can happen to me. That, I, 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 I do not possess enough money to have got her through that, and she got through it. But I come back from Spain, and I stayed there and made sure that I was with by her side. How much money do you think you've squandered over the years? Fucking what? Well, on women. <laughs> <laughs> They're the fucking, fucking worst. Fight. Millions. Ah, uh, yes. Do you think the J? Did yeah. you? You must have squandered a good bit, Count, now. Especially with the Genesis days, the Dodd days, and well, other bits of stuff you were uh, doing. Partying years. Once, once I started taking the drugs and especially the coke and that lifestyle and going high beef and li living the lifestyle and and partying and and. Oh, Ridiculous! I, 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 if when my sister worked out in the space of about with, with the ex and all that, I worked out I've done about five, five hundred, six hundred grand with her in the space of about seven years. That was that was a lot of money. But my sister, she worked it all out on the paper. What like when we, when we, when my mum and dad died, they sold the house. She bought me out of mum and dad's masonry. Money I had from here, money from there, other money and all that. And then I bought her out, uh, her side of the the of the home in Spain because when they died, that bit was hers. So she worked out a quarter of a million pounds just then. And I and I, I had another hundred here and a few hundred. So yeah, I, I, I did. did do you know what? Easy come, easy go. When you, if you, which I do appreciate now, like when someone goes to work and they work an hour and they hypothetically get £10, that £10 is worth like 10000 what I get because they've had to work for every penny. When you've lived in the worlds I've lived in and moved in, you lo lose appreciation of money. You squander because easy come, easy go and you don't appreciate it. But now, it's a big learning curve, but it's late in life. The only people who deserve my money are the people that I love and the people that care about me. And it's got to be my children, my closest friends. And listen, you know, like if, and people like Joe, who's, 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 who's stuck by me and, and always loved me and come back into my life and made me realise that I don't need a fucking party girl that's 20 years younger than me. They're, they're nothing but an headache. They're on a different level. I don't even like the same music. Like, the same things. It's all right. The sex in the bedroom, like, like you know. And I'm not being crude. I don't mean to be crude here, but that's what it is most of the time. A young bird in the bedroom. It's just narcissistic eat, alter ego coming out. But then after that, you're worn off. Two days of fucking sniffing your brains out, drinking and partying, or being on the fever or wherever you are, you got to sit there for the rest of the week and watch fucking shit like fucking telly subbies. <laughs> no, you know what I mean. There's you got nothing in common, really. Yeah. It's um, like you say. It's just it's more lust. Yeah, it's it not is. friendship. It's, it's more it's, two relationships. Yes. I'm at this stage now. There's no like you yeah, need. It's, you um, need someone who knows friendship. you. You want someone who's got your back. You want it's someone soulmate. who gives you peace. Someone soulmate. who doesn't bring you drama. Someone yeah. who's can understand you. Remember when you come from a dark past or you come from fucked up environments. Our life is full of chaos. As a man, it's always drama. There's always men yeah. out trying to yeah. out work your steal your messes or steal your yeah. money. There's always yeah. that's just the way men are ingrained. Yeah. They're always wanting what other people have. And you just want and someone to come into your life who just brings you that. Peace. And one thing I've learned is see when you're with a young bird and he's got a figure and it's half a soul and it's you know, it's done and yeah, they've they've been lap dancers uh, like and all that, they've done stripping, whatever. I I don't judge someone on that. But they're, what you got to understand is they they are grafters. When they're strippers and they're lap dancers, they they're taking money off of men. They they're grafting them. What so that that mentality goes out goes out into a relationship. Do you understand? And when they 
when someone like me, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't give them the attention like they they get in the clubs and all that. I'm not interested. I just when I go in there, I just go for a pint with my mates and a, and a, a late drink, right? So then, what happens? That kills your problems because they allow other blokes to to look at them and uh, uh, like. They like to, the attention. They like to but be fancy. Women crave attention. Men crave and they, respect. Yeah, and they play up on it. When but it women, are, so. women know how to play the game. Yeah, of course they do. Fuck's sake, they ain't silly. Nah. Even the sweet innocent ones. They're yep. the biggest players. That's yep. the, every. We're all kind of characters in this yeah. life, and especially today's day and age with all the social media, women crave that attention. And the scary thing is, not I can't speak for every woman because there's a lot of good women out there, but the majority of women would try and look for better all the time and yeah, if it comes yeah, along they would fuck you over yeah. in a minute to try and raise that that it's, it's just it's just the way of the world now and I, i'm only speaking from my own fucking no, it's like you when you're younger at night when i'm like myself it's like you, you ain't better come in i don't think we are we're, we're good to come in right a bit like bernie but <laughs> but what i'm saying to you we know that and we're, and we're confident people We've got character and like we, we, we know how to talk to people. We know how to, we got the chat and that goes a big way. And then we get a bit, we forget ourselves that we're a little bit narcissistic and, and then we've got that alter ego and it's always think, you know, fucking hell, I could fuck Paul. And you do and you, and it's wrong. Yeah, we're still, we fuck up. yeah, we're still, I still think I'm in my fucking 20s. Yeah, you know it's saying? the same here. Yeah. yeah, my brain's 20s, yeah. my body's fucking telling me oh, different. Might you know as well mate. It's, uh, <laughs> But life is life. Yeah. Do you ever have nightmares, Carlton? Do you ever have many night flashbacks over the past? Um, I, I, do, do you know what I do? If I have a bad day, I know oh, that night I'm going to have a bad night. Certain things might be, say like there might be something come up and it's to do with tongue. Like, like this tonight, I will go home and have a diazepam. pan. Do you know why? Because I'll, I'll, it'll, it'll, I'll have a dream about what I've been talking about, might have been my dad or something. So whatever I've spoke about the day before. So if if I've had a good day and I'm chilled and I'm just naturally tired and I'm in a good I'm in a good place, I can sleep. But if I'm not, I do have yeah, I have nightmares. Do you think you'll ever get closure with Tony's mother? I've I've made myself have get the closure. There ain't no one out there that's, listen, if I don't know whoever's done it, whatever the, the real people. Um, I don't really want to now. It's it's been it's too long. What am I going to do? Go after old men and and kill them? Whatever. What, 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 at, at the time, I I wanted to kill the people that killed him, obviously, because he's my mate. But like a sixty-five, what, what what does it prove? Where does it get me? Is that the answer? Yeah, it's um, you know. If it was my child, like like I said, my own blood, like someone murdered my, my kid, I would I would spend every day of my life till, till I got that person and, and killed him. I, like, you know, because that's you just took my baby away from me, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. it's a different thing. It, it, we both lived in a world with the rules. We knew what the rules were. And if you break the rules and you tread on the tongue toes, there's consequences. And if you've got consequences and there's always someone bigger, more powerful than you. And if you make enemies, you've got to look over your shoulder. And if you upset the wrong people, there's going to be consequences. And that's why you, people don't actually think, a lot of people, what they're actually doing. But, but I'm, I'm not saying it's the drugs. Drugs has got a lot to do with it because they don't give a fuck when they're on drugs. But yes, yeah, so I've, I've come to terms with it now. It is what it is. Yeah, if you kind of dealt with the fact that you always be kind of connected with those murders, or because you knew them, no, not not the murders, I'm not connected to murders. I'm talking no, about not connected. My friendship, but you know what I'm saying, because it's yeah. the documentaries last yeah, year, you get listen, movies I, 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 and books. I, listen, I'm always going to put my name's always going to be put to it because mm -hmm. I've been out there. Yes, I've I've mentioned it in books. I've done documentaries. I've been interviewed. So I can't. You can't be that person and then just say, oh, I don't want to talk about it no more. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, I'll put myself on that pedestal. So, yes. Why do you think it's still so ongoing, though? So many years later? Because... The like, people being convicted because it was a copper on who says, yeah. um, in a documentary that he believes it was, they were the killers. Whether, I know they've pled their innocence. Um, but there's just so much around that, um, especially with... 
Because who was the, a, who then, was the young girl? Who was the girl who died with an ecstasy tablet? Leah Bates. And that was the copper's daughter. Could yeah. it have potentially been a copper who done it? A clean hat? What, hit like that? Yeah. But this is the thing with what, what our, our, our dear friend done. He, straight away, it was his dealers that, that sold her the pills. Right? He organised her for her to have the ecstasy. And then when she died... What did he do? He went straight to the police with the bag of pills, said they're the samples, uh, grasped up his own dealers, right? He was getting the ecstasy from Tony. He was charging the dealers rent in there. So is he not part of that conspiracy? Why did he... Because So that's is that what... He went He went to court against them, and put, then people went to prison, right? <coughs> but he was one of the main instigators... It was his door, Rackles. He was the head doorman. He was in charge of the, the, the drug dealers. He was taking money. He admits taking £500 a week rent off of them. <coughs> so, why why wasn't there an investigation in? Why wasn't he nicked? Because as far as I'm concerned, he's as much to blame for for, their, for her death as Tony. He was part of that little, little syndicate of the dealers and the drugs that were being sold. Yeah, it just all seems messy. But who was the guy? Was it Tony Tucker who done the pizza manager? Is that a true no, story? No, that's Pat Tate. Yeah, yeah. Was that a true story? Yeah. And what about the young boy? Did he inject somebody with gear or something and kill them? How was the truth <clears> and all that? They uh, that was over a big puff deal, and um, Craig could fill out with Tony, <coughs> and um, the, the, they he he. he well, supposedly stole the parcel of um, solid, right? Then uh, it belonged to someone else, They're another little heavy firm. Then I, and then they wanted their money back or the the, the stuff. Um, they came to me because I was friends with Tony. Uh, I negotiated an agreement, and there was a settlement. And that was that. There's so many people that could have done that. Yeah, Carolina. Yeah. Did they say it was two shooters? You know, listen, I've, John Wayne's put, he put his uh, feelers out to approach me, right? And I thought, I've never met Jack Wayne's, never see him. I see Mickey Steele a few times with Tony and Pat in the corner talking secretive and Tony always told me, mentioned Mickey Steele this, Mickey Steele that, because him and Pat were mates inside. He always said, oh yeah, he's right shrewd, he's like paranoid as this. And so I knew, but I never ever, in any of the company ever see Jack Wombs, right? Never heard of his name. So as far as I'm concerned, like I knew what Tony, only what Tony had told me that was to do with Mickey. So how can I accuse someone without any proof? I've never, I've never seen any proof to say it was him. Nothing. I don't even know. I don't even think we can still done it. But I do know we can still was a part of it. I believe, due to people like the Fatty, who was all over the old bill, blaming Tony, and when it could co coincidence that like within three weeks of her, her dying, that they got killed. Three weeks later. Do you not think that's suspicious? I'm just talking out of turn, just, just top of my head. That they, 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 that that they they could not have done that without professionals people there. Yeah, to be using that for me, it looks like a professional hat. Yeah, um, a million percent. It's not somebody from the streets. No, That's no. too clean cut the way it's yeah. been done. Yeah, it's somebody who's who's stone cold. Yeah, yeah. And um, what about like, who's Jasper? Who was he? Always who's just Jasper mentioned never done that. Was he's he? No, but he, yeah. was he an informant? Well, there's there's rumours going around. He's a town. I, I know. I knew him. He's not alive now, so I don't speak ill of the dead. Oh, is he dead? Yeah, yeah. I can't. What I'm saying to you is, where these people keep on and on and on, he can't defend himself. I'm not in a position to say, blah blah blah. What about Napparelli? Who I had on that says it was his dad who done it. That's uh, it's just you humiliated himself by doing that. That was embarrassing. I think he was on Big Lee's podcast. Yeah. Yeah. He may have. Yeah. Big Lee's all right. And then he went on the documentary and said the same thing, didn't he? Yeah, Big Lee's sound man. Yeah. Um, but why does everybody want to be part of it? 
Fucking keep up. If you do know anything, man, don't say a word. I don't know who done it, and I don't want to know who done it. I don't want to be part of it. But what I'm saying to you is, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it because I'll talk about the good points with Tony. Like, he's my friendship with him. What was he's the good my... points, Carlton, with Tony Tucker? Because just... obviously the, the books and the fellows play him out as a mad monster. He wasn't, no. He was one, he, like, see how I many you would sit here and have a laugh and a giggle and bounce. He had a wicked sense of humour. Me and him together never stopped taking the piss out of each other. I was the one, because of his hairstyle, I, I called him Wiggy, right? And it was his birthday, right? <laughs> it was some but, no, and, and no one would say, and he used to wear Machino shirts. So I used to call him, because you remember Tony Montana, Scarface, I used to call him t t Tony Machino, right? But I had my little nicknames for him, and I called him Wiggy, and he just laughed. So it was his birthday, so we had a birthday party for him anyway. So I said, I got his print. So I went and got a mannequin's head, right? I got a wig, and I cut it in the shape of his hair, put it in the box, wrapped it all up and gave him his birthday card. I've got your birthday present here. He's opened it up, he's pulled out and it's a fucking head with, it, with a wig on. And he went, I went, happy birthday, Wiggy. And he's laughing, his bollocks off. He went, you can't. Like, that's being normal. That's, that's mates bantering, bouncing off each other. And we used to have a wicked sense of humour together. Like We had so many laughs and, and he, like I said to you, he, like ran your missus or you, you know, if you were seeing a bird, he, 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 he would never like thing it. He'd just like cover your back. If I went missing for the weekend, he'd go around to Denny's and take a bunch of flowers in the car. Say, look, he's on a bit of work for me. He'll, he'll, he'll be back like in three days or whatever. He's all right though. His phone's not working. He's back with his flat. And, he, and he'd do that. That's what mates do. You know what I mean? Cover me ass. And what, then I'll turn up on a fucking Monday. <laughs> what do you think your downfall was? Drugs. What was he taking? Uh, when he he used to just do pills, he wasn't really a sniffer. He'd go out and do pills, and we've had like, pills, good raves, and had some really good times. When Pat, no, it was just before Pat came out, he started doing new bone, and everyone said he said to me like because he had the the weeder shop in Ilford, and uh, he used to sell like, all protein and get steroids and stuff and everything, and he went. Um, he said, you've got to try this new bone. I went, what's new bone? Because I was like, I was doing steroids, like, obviously, you know what I mean? And uh, and, and, and I thought, new bone ain't a steroid. And I, and I, and he said, it's, oh, it's a painkiller. What it does, you inject it mainstream, and what it does, it, it's, it kills all the pain and you can put, push more weight and it make like to, to get stronger. And I went, well, what is it? And I, I said, and I, looked, I checked it out. I went, it's morphine based. It's, it's like heroin. It's, it's like an opioid. It's it's a, a painkiller, but everyone was doing it. And in in, in the, in the uh, bodybuilding world, because I do a lot of bodybuilding, they were all on new bone, like injecting it like mainstream. And with, with with the steroids, which you can't do mainstream, but with that you can put it into your mainstream. And then they started injecting coke, and then they were mixing coke, uh, speed, water, new bone. And it was just a concoction, and they, and they was doing it all the time, and just been like it was completely different. And then Pat come out, you know, Pat was like on the pipe. Uh, so you on the Craig, crack? Yeah, yeah. He was, he was, he was, he was, he was on the pipe. Uh, Craig was on the pipe, and I think Tony done it behind my back because like he started coughing, right? And he never touched a fag in his life, never smoked, not a joint, and he started getting having coughs and all stuff. Uh, but I never see him do it. He would never do it in front of me. But I just, you know, when the sweating and and uh, and I just and he he went to me. I went man one day. I had to kick the door off, and they'd been not out there nuts. And it, it was him and Craig sitting there, and they just and Craig said, "Like, can you see him?" To me, the little people. And he went, "Yeah, he like Tony's laughing." And they said, "They're running around the room." I went, "There's no cunt in here." I went, "What the fuck, Tony?" You doing? He went. So I go upstairs and I try to chat. I went, Tone, you can't carry on like this, doing shit like this, injecting. And he went, go on, try it. Right. And he went, hey, I'll make. And he mixed one up with the thing. And and I went, yeah. And he went and put it in my arm. I went, you ain't my mate. I said, if you give that to me, you are not my friend. And I tested him, and then I knew uh, that was on the slippery road, and I'd lost him because he was going to inject me with new Bane Coke and whatever else was in there into my mainstream, and he went to do it. 
See, when they're on that though, it seems as if they would have been easy to get anyway. But t- somebody could have just went through the door when they were parking. They'd been an easy yeah. target. Somebody yeah. could have done them anyway to be free them in the car. But were they high? Do you know when they went there, or they, they must have been? Well, they they was on it every day. They because they wanted uh, uh, they were ringing around, and I know a couple of people for an ounce of gear that day, the day of the meet. They wanted an ounce of Charlie. Um, so. I don't know whether they got it because last time I spoke to Tony was the day before and uh, he said to me, it's all going to go well. We've got this meat, uh, this, this, this drug come in, we're going to rob this geezer. And I went, oh, fucking hell, Tony. I said, like, and I've had a few phone calls like, about what they've done. And I went, are you sure about it? He went, no, no, no. He said, this cunt deserves it and all that. And what he said about um, Pat and all that and... Uh, and I went, he went, I'm going to look out you. I promise you, I can't, I can't wait. He said, when I, when it comes off, he said, I'm going to give you a lump of dough, get you out of trouble, I'm going to look after you and all that. You're my mate. And, but it never happened. So. See the place they were killed? How far was that from his house? He was living, uh, I would say, up the A130. Half hour, tops. Could they have actually been just sitting there smoking a the pipe and just... Could the farmer... How far-fetched is this? Could it have yeah. been a farmer who just came out and blasted them? Yeah, An absolute yeah. unknown? Well, listen, you've... Uh, but this 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 field was the field uh, where this... Uh, supposedly, he used to land his plane and drop loads off. And it was uh, uh, at Redden. So I can't really tell you because I never I had no dealings. I never knew what, the, what was going on. And... If Tony done it home, it, I'd ne- I never see him do it home. Like, I think he always did it out. Like, I, I remember we had the office next door to the shop. Uh, obviously, Bernie remember that because he was, as he said in his thing, he was partners with Tony. So he would have been in my offices and where me and Tony were had a security company. So, but I didn't see him in there. So I don't want to make you look silly. But anyway, um, so we had a joining thing. So you had the weed shop, the shop next door, which is the security shop. And we had like a proper office, glass up, two-way mirrors, you know, like the old coppers we can set. And then like you had a key to go in the back. So I've gone in with you. I went, like, this is a weekday. And this is one of the things I've had. And like, I'm not really I said, where's Tony? To, to little Andy who's running the shop. And then he went to me, he's in, he's in the room, in your office. I went, what? They just locked themselves in. They got the key because we could go in through the back or, the, or from the street. So we, it's gone in there and they're it pitch black in there and they're both sitting there on the floor, banging up, rejecting. I couldn't, couldn't get him to open the door. Wouldn't, wouldn't answer me. Open the door, nothing. Just went on. How powerful would they have been if they weren't on drugs? Capabilities. Mm. With the right people. Dangerous, yeah. Because being gay and one of the things, because I've, I've, I've been out on stuff when, when they've been straight and we've done stuff. So I, I've seen it with my own eyes, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. If gone about the right way, carried themselves the right way, didn't take liberties and do the wrong things, yeah, they could have earned a lot of money. But when you're getting money and diseases, things and all that, and you've got an habit, like... I know Pat was doing like buying an ounce of gear every day of the week when you're piping it. And I don't know because I've never done that, but I know that that don't last long if you're on the pipe or whatever. So, I mean, when I walked in the fucking hospital, Craig was, had, had a two little coke bottle. They said that he had a room on his own. Fucking had pills in there, fucking brasses, fucking, he had a handgun in, in the hospital, like Pat and he, and he, I watched, I was standing there when the nurse walked in and Craig's got the fucking coke bottle making a big fucking crack pipe to, to do the crack. And I went, what the fuck? I walked straight out of here. He was I only went, a young kid, Tim, as well, what? 26. He was only a young kid, huh? Yeah. Waste of life. So what was he doing, smoking the crack in the hospital bed? They didn't give a fuck. They just did not. They thought... That because of the drugs and everything they were doing and the way they were behaving, they thought that they were untouchable. The police wouldn't go near them. And I, I do believe the police were scared of them. 
like because they didn't give a fuck. They rubbed it in. Do you know what I mean? They, they, especially Pat. So it wouldn't be. It would have had to be them to take him out of the game without anyone knowing to stop him. Because the more drugs you take, and the more and and, the, and the, that dangerous type of person, you've got to, you've got to kill him. Yeah, you become too much of a threat. Yeah. What about the the casual scene? And because uh, I know you've been to Italy, and that. How did you end up with a connection with the Italians? Well, uh, me me Casca uh, Cas got a hold of me, and through social media, so I didn't do a lot of social media then. And uh, the Lazio boys, because um, the Canio and the West Ham, we got invited out um, for a weekend, and uh, a special guest, and uh, their top boys is. God rest his soul, Fabrizio, their number one, was in prison when we went out there. So the the next one down was was running it. And we were guests for the weekend. They took us to uh, Juventus at home as the first game and they lost 1-0. Uh, and we were there for the weekend. They took us to, they got their own little clubhouse and all that. And then um, Cass only went out there once and he was the first black man to go, go in with the Lazio because they're, they're far right ultras. And um, but they treated him with total respect, uh, and then I started going out there because big Alexandra, who I became really close with, um, he's like because quite a lot of them West Ham fans, he was a big West Ham fan, so he came over. I took him to Millwall away, and like, and then I went, to, I went to the Roma derbies, went to a few games at Lazio, then for British show come out, uh, and I finally got to meet him, loved it, but he didn't speak a word of English. Um, but that's just crazy. And then I got friendly, and then it was the last game of the season. They'd done the street party, and I had to get on the mic and sing Bubbles. But so far, about 3,000 Italians all singing, trying to sing, I'm a love Friday, the in the bubbles. But they got a double decker bus, right? And they'd, they'd all DJs, bars in the street, they shut the road, and on it, they'd like a, a, a London double decker bus with Lazio flags, with in the city firm, all West Ham flags on it. And he went past and all that. And, um, and I thought, fuck, I can't speak Italian. I was going, oh, I'd go on tour and I was just going, Paolo di Canio. And they were going, Paolo di Canio. I couldn't speak a word of Italian, but it was great. And then the last game, that game was they, they had in Milan at home. And in Milan, they're like, they're cousins. They're, they're, like, they're like connected. Um, obviously, because of the, the ultra thing and, and the, 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 the right way. So, I got introduced to all their top boys, uh, the Inter Land boys, and they were really top people. They bought me drinks. There was all bars going on the street, the street party, they were there. And then they invited me out to Milan, and I went out there as a guest. I thought, so you know what, I'm going to go to Milan. Oh, I'd love to go to San Siro, but it was out of season, so I went out there, had a weekend out there, met a load of their top boys and that, looked after us, went for meals and that, and I thought, I quite like Milan at City. It's quite... The, the food, it's got a bit of style about it, Milan. And, the, and the, obviously, like the San Zero. I and mean, then the next time I went out there, I went to uh, the San Zero. Went to, to the game. I went to, I've been going, I've, I've, I try every year to get out to at least one derby against AC, the Milan derby. Unbelievable. Uh, I went out there when Lazio were at Milan. So when Lazio come up, I, I, I knew the Lazio fans there, their clubhouse. And then they take me into the curve and old, and I go straight to the front, 10,000 fans, stand next to one, and they call me El Capitano. I mean, he's like, you're a superior. And no one else can stand with me. Whoever's with me has to stand away, because if you're a guest, you, you have to stand to the right of the number one. But the, but the end has to be full first, and then you're walked in with him, and you go to the front. It's quite unbelievable. The Italians don't fuck about, they seem well organised, but you go back to the Mafia days, man, in Sicily, and they were always organised, but the, the, the casuals, the ultras, the, the, same, the same as like the Polish they're still and stuff, connected. the Ukrainians, it's, 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 their ultras are mad. They're still connected to the street. Yeah, because when Maradona was at Napoli, yeah. it was the Mafia who was running it. Yeah, and it, it, this, it's, 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 the Mafia runs... He was a wee it. fucking gangster. Yeah. Did you ever see him kneeing the fucking, well, one of the players I've or the fans? With my own eyes. I've seen him with my own eyes. I've been there. The, the actual Mafia, people, like, what it is, they've got their own teams and everything, but, like, the, the big cities, they're, they're like, they're, they're, it's still the yeah. street, the street and the terraces run together. Yeah, because when they see Milan, see if they're losing... 
and they're on a bad run, they'll have to come out and speak to the fucking ultras. Yeah. On the part, the managers are listening. I've been there, the directors come out and uh, and the chairman. If there's a problem, they have to go. It, it was Franco at the time, he's number one. And I've seen him talking and he took me behind the scenes for the directors. I've met the teams, I've met AC Inter Milan, I've met the AC players, I've met uh, Figo, he's introduced me to Figo and all that. Like, down to him, and he's got that man. He can walk anywhere in the ground. And if there's a problem with the fans, they need a, a liaison, and they go to Franco, but he's not number one now, and he would he he, he would sort it out. He was, do you know, what I mean? he was the in between man as well. Who's That's the top? Who's the top firm in Italy? In Italy, um, it's a Lazio, Milan between like Lazio and and Inter. They're both crazy. Uh, but I've been away on away games with with Inter, so I've experienced like the fucking. But like, I wouldn't like to pick, so I'm going to put them on even because they're they're like cousins. Um, Atlanta, I like the Millwall of the Serie A, twenty thousand yeah, but they're they're, they're crazy. But AC Milan, I think they've got a good firm. Uh, Juventus are like the Man United, like of. The Premier League because they, they they win everything. There, there's a there's a few f- there's a few good firms out there. Verona, uh, I've been there, but yeah, but most of them most of them have got ultras like they they'll, they'll have ultras. But it's the power of 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 you know when you've got like say you might have most teams in Italy the smaller clubs might only have two or three thousand ultras, but you got like in there. You've got 10, 15,000 will turn up, <laughs> or 20, or 30. It's like you, you just can't see it. Like, you know what I mean? And that shows like that. They're curving old. It's completely packed, and everyone will fight. Mm-hmm. It's just crazy. What do you think of the state of the UK the now? I think it's important that we touch on the kind of UK and the mess it's in and the riots and the sad. troubles. Why do, you think it's, why do you think we're falling apart? I just think, I think. The the people that run the country, not not just blaming Labour now, but it's going to make it worse. Is they forgot about our heritage, and 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 let, let's just face it. Look, help the world, help people. People will come here. Like I've got a black foster brother. Who's I've, I've got friends, seek friends who love the. I'm not saying, but do not. Why why are we giving out everything that we're all our values and away to? Really, our enemy. That's how I look at it. Is we we're not Muslims. We we're, we're a Christian country. What about our heritage? What about the working class people? What about all the people that paid all their taxes? And what about all the people that fought two world wars to stop an invasion? What about the people, the young soldiers that have lost limbs in Afghanistan, Iraq, to uh, and to free these countries so they can so they can cross Europe and just come into our country. You know, but, uh, like, like all the people that have died for them, you know, and but do people forget when when a bomber walks into fucking like Manchester Arena and kills fifty one of our children, blows a bomb? That's, is that is that swept under the table now? When children are being killed, you know, why is it always children? Yeah, but you can't even speak out against it now, can't? Because no. you're a racist or a far no. right. Do you know what I'm, I'm saying? Not racist. No, that, no, nobody's like I say. You're a concerned fucking parent. But we're losing our identity. What I'm um, saying to you is, yes, come to this country. You wouldn't live here. But embrace our culture. Don't change our country to your culture. Embrace it together. Be proud to, you know what I mean? You know. Lee, who I had on earlier, he was a Marine. And he yeah. was an undercover. He went undercover. Yeah, I, migrant, I was um, Immigrant and... He's saying it's just young kids in their 20s who are uh, no passport, no papers, who are just travelling the border, coming here and fucking causing mayhem. Like, but it's different if you've got your passport. Like, when I have people in other countries, I've got passports. If you've got 100 young men, each, each dinghy, 120, sometimes 80s, from the age of 20 to 30, right, no paperwork on them, no ID, that you, you can tell whether they're either African or they're, or they're, they're Arab or whatever. Like, yet they travelled from their country all the way through Europe. They've lived on the on the beaches, 
in the jungles and tents and everything, and then got on a boat with no paperwork, like, and, but they still got their phones. And then they come here, and it's it's on it's on a plate. It's wrong. Yeah, well, you know, some of them might be good people. I'm, I'm not saying, but major why why is your identity? Why why not come across with your real paperwork and 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 your real age and and, and who you are, and ask for asylum? Yeah, but that's just everything seems Listen, mad. Listen, we can sit for the next ten hours in this yeah. one, and all people will do go. You're right wing. No, I'm not right wing. Like you're Scottish and I'm British, whatever. And but like we're one country. But is you're proud to be Scottish. I'm proud to be like English. Is like but that, we're not enemies. But why do they hate the West so much? Why? 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 Yeah, that's because, what I was saying to Lee. Listen, I'm Scottish, but majority of my work. As in England, I'm an England majority of the yeah. time of the year, and like I say, I've got friends everywhere around the yeah, UK. Same as me, Scotland, but, England, know. Ireland, Wales, yeah. uh, Northern Ireland. Like, f I would same back everybody from yeah. these nations because it's my people. It's, yeah. I'm proud Scotsman, fucking love my country, yeah. but I'm also fucking patriotic because the majority of people who watch my show are from all around the UK. Same as me. Do you know what I'm saying? Same so, as me. Uh, I, how can I just? pick one pick this help the people here first yeah. help our own first the fucking suicides on the rise homeless on the rise addictions on the rise immigrants are coming here taking the taxpayers but, but, money but the, the one thing that really does me which makes me annoyed like when I this is that soldier there that real me is when we've got homeless veterans sleeping in cardboard boxes on the street and not with no money and people are walking into this country, the countries they fought to free from dictators, from ayatollahs or whatever, and lost limbs, and they've, 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 they've got PDST and all that. They're, they're living on the street. Why have they not? Why ain't they been put in hotels? Why have they not got three hot meals a day? Why ain't they got to shower, clean clothes, and help to get them back on, the, on their, like, you know what I mean? And you say about mental wealth, them poor fuckers just walks on their minds, you know. And what's this mental wealth thing? They're making excuse every time. He, oh, what about that soldier walks out of the barracks with his missus, that colonel, his uniform? And then they're, 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 they're saying he's, he's been knocked back seven times for whatever. So I don't even know. I'm not interested. But I am, it does, I am interested in about that poor man being stabbed to death with his wife because he's walked out of the barracks. What about the fucking... What about the kids who were killed? But yeah, the guy who done it, they showed a picture of him when he was like 12 years old. Yeah. Fucking show the picture of him now. Yeah. Who gives a fuck about the religion See, or the race? Know. Show the people because what he's it's, done. Because it's propaganda. They're brainwashing the, the, the general public. The most people fight. Most English people are too scared to say anything because what he's doing is like, it's like communism. It's like a Putin type thing. You say anything bad against me, bang. You're, you you get locked up. Somebody's getting a free year for a Facebook post. Yeah, but this is what's going to happen here. Take that away Stalinism. It's, it's what I'm saying. It's communism. Yes, listen. I don't have a go at you for being communist, and that's your beliefs, right? But please, fucking hell, you you can still be a communist and be proud to be English. Am I right? All the communists that are Russian are proud to be Russian. Am I right? Whoever Putin is, and 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 he's, and then people that have gone missing, who stand up and say anything, anyone says anything against the government, anything, but they're still they're, they're coming, but they're still proud of their country. Would you see Putin letting in boatloads and boatloads and boatloads and boatloads of of refugees? No, they don't have. He'd blow them out of water. Yeah, they don't have that in Russia. Look what he's doing to Ukraine, and that's that's part of part of their continent. But he was told, but because NATO were getting closer, Putin tried to sign a peace agreement with Ukraine. America told Ukraine no. It's all money, man. It's all propaganda. It's all. It's Politics. All, we uh, don't even know. Yeah, well, that's, these are the real gangsters. Yeah. They are the real fucking gangsters. Yeah. How are you feeling today, brother? Well, I'm good, mate. I'm yeah. Mate, I've been blindly speaking to you. Yeah, yeah. always. Yeah. And um, yeah. what's your social media? Is in that counting for people to come forward and maybe drop you a little message? Yeah, well, just I'm on, I'm on the Twitter. I always go to Twitter, currentleach.com and everything else. Um, just wanted to say um, I will be coming back to you for a little little thing what what I'm involved in. Yep, I look forward to it. If I get it. the financing and this project, um, and obviously I want you on board with I mean. me, uh, I would like to do like a little 20-minute 
thingy with you that we can put out there and uh, advertising it, what it's to do with. And it's for a good cause as well, like I said, cancer. Mm. But it's a project, that, it's another project close to my heart. But um, we could sit here talking all day and all night, can't we? So, yeah, oh, fucking uh, days and weeks and just months. Just thank you. I want to just say thank you to everyone that supported me, everyone that's given me that loyalty. I wouldn't be here without my friends. James is a friend. And whether I see him two years ago, I'll give you my anger, my heart. He's a good man. I trust him. But I wouldn't be Colton Leach as a celebrity without the people, you, who buy my books, my films. I'm really humble. Come to my shows. Thank you for your support because it makes me get out of bed every day and makes me come here and let you know that I'm still here. And to, as a little reminder, yeah, I'm all good. All right, down to you. For anybody watching, Colton, that's maybe battling right now in life, what advice would you have for them? In this day and age, we're living in a different world, aren't we? We had a lot more help. We, uh, you know what it is? We had peers. We had um, people that run like like we all Glasgow, East London. Pe people looked up to you. People guided you. People you listened to and respected. And I think uh, where there's none of that, youngsters are lost, and they're and they're and they're embedding their their, their brain into drugs and drug abuse and everything and social media. It's the wrong avenue. Talk to people with experience in life. If you don't talk, you can't get help. And, you know, the so, like social workers and all people like, you need to talk to real people, people that have been there and done it, what their mistakes are, for them to, to advise you the right route to take. Mm -hmm. I'm there if you want to talk to me. Would you like to finish up on anything else, brother? No, I'm happy just to be here and have a chat with you and do get another podcast out. It's good to see you, my brother. I wish you all the best for the future, Colin. Good to Big see love. you, mate. See you soon.